Hi, and welcome to Talk Straight Bible. I'm your host, Jeremiah Zantanetti, and I'm here with my wife, and we're here to bring you the Word of God. Today's message is simple, but it's a question that has two answers, and we'll get to that in the end. And the question is, why does it keep happening? Why does it keep happening? Well, the reason we're going to see in Scripture, why does it keep happening? And it can create a lot of confusion or put you into deep thought, because, you know, we think about things all the time, and the question is, why does it keep happening? Well, what does what what is it that keeps happening? Well, let's look. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, it says, For all have sinned and come short, or fall short of the glory of God. Now think about this. What keeps happening to us? We keep falling. We keep messing up. Well, we all know that we struggle with insecurities. I have my own insecurities. You have yours. The world has insecurities. And insecurities basically is that we're not sure of what or how, what we are, and how we're going to do things. And we have our own securities. We have our own downfalls when it comes to that. I'm not secure sometime. Are you? No. (laughs) And we all struggle with obscurity. We all have dark places in our lives where... We look to and we say, that's pretty dark. And we know the dark places in our lives, don't we? And those places where it's dark, we need to deal with that. We need to ask God to please shed light in that obscurity so that I can overcome this. And we all struggle with emptiness. No matter how filled we are with the Holy Spirit, that human part of us, at times we feel empty because That's just part of the fall. Remember, we are fallen creatures, but we are saved by grace. And so that emptiness is not something that we should fear, but ask God to help us to fill it. We all struggle with perplexities. Life is perplexed in every way. Perplexed thoughts, perplexed relationships, perplexed children, perplexed families. Everything around us can be perplexed at times, and we all struggle with that. And you know what? You may say to yourself, I'm blessed. I'm blessed to, I'm too blessed to be stressed, too blessed to be with the mess and all that other good stuff. But the reality is, is that when you're in a perplexity, it's not that easy to just get out. And we all struggle with fears. We all struggle with fears. Now, that was, that was one of the main things that brought me to the Lord. That was the thing that had me. Fears. Paranoia. It brought me to Jesus. When I realized that he's the only security that I have, that he's the only one that can melt fears away, that he's the only one that, that can help me become strong, I knew that I needed him, and it was those fears that brought me to my knees. The worst fear was the fear to die. We all fear death. Being a pastor now, I've done so many funerals, I stopped counting them. And no matter how many funerals I do, I could never get used to seeing a dead body in a casket. I I just can't get used to that. It's not something that we should get used to. When you see all the millions of people that have died in war, how can we get used to that? How can we just walk by and say, well, that's just the way it is. It's not like that. We look with fear, and, and there's something about it that captures our imagination and and puts us in a place of perplexity. We struggle with all this stuff. And yet, in all of it, I realize something. I realize this. No matter how perplexed, no matter how many fears, no matter how empty I feel, no matter how much obscurity I see, no matter how much insecurity I see, one thing is important, and that is the Word of God in my life. It helps me to overcome But the question is, why did God give us 10 commandments? Why 10? Why 10? When we look at it, we see, first of all, that God gave us commandments so that we can keep a structure. The standard of God still stand. It never falls. The Bible tells us that God gave the 10 commandments to Israel. They just came fresh out of Egypt. Finally got to Mount Zion. Mount Sinai, 
maybe 11 days. Actually, it was a month, a month. They say a month. They say 31 days. Finally got to Mount Sinai, and then what happens? God visits them in fire. He visits them in a cloud. They hear thunder, all these things, and God speaks to them, and God gives them the Ten Commandments through Moses. And if you go through them, I mean, they're very simple, and I don't mind quoting them. They're, 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 they're excellent, and that is, you know, God is first. Let's put it that way. Don't make any images of anything that is human and worship it. Uh, don't uh, take the name of the Lord in vain. Keep a holy day. Honor your mother and your father. Do not kill. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Don't be a false witness. Do not covet. Those are the Ten Commandments. And that's why I tell people which one you don't need. We need them all. That's why he gave us Ten Commandments. And you know something? When we look at the things that we've gone through in life, God gave those, chem, those Ten Commandments to protect us. Sometimes we look away from them and we fall in trouble. Mm -hmm. Such person like that is David. The life of David actually teaches us something. Remember David when he saw Bathsheba? He was on the top of his roof. Roof. He should have been out there warring with the, with the troops, you know. It was a time when the kings, the Bible says, went and they set the battle line. There's a time to go out. And they said, we got to protect Israel. We have to protect Jerusalem. And he should have been out there. He gave the command, we'll go. But he stood behind in his room and he mm -hmm. chilled out and he took it easy. And, and he went on his roof, to, I guess, to get some air. And when he looked, he saw a woman named Bathsheba taking a bath. And, well, the lust rose in his heart and he wanted her. And he sent his servant, and the servant, I mean, I could see his servant. I mean, you don't, you don't, you, the king tells the servant something, you don't really speak back to the king. Mm -hmm. But the servant said, my lord, you know, uh, you know, that is Bathsheba, that is Uriah's wife. Get her anyway. Mm -hmm. Remember, I'm the king, right? Well, the life of David illustrates this point perfectly when we look at it. And it's very simple. David did not only commit adultery, but he constructed the death of Bathsheba's husband mm. and put him in the front line of the war to kill him mm. because she got pregnant anyway. But you know what's interesting? This King David who knew the law, the Ten Commandments, he knew the 613 laws and he knew the traditions of Israel and he knew the God of Israel. Yes, he did. And yet it took him 9 to 12 months that passed by before David confessed his sin to the Lord. And he didn't even confess it on his own. He needed help. And so the Lord sent his holy prophet, <laughs> Nathaniel, or Nathan, to illustrate his fault. And you could just see Nathan the prophet speaking to David. I love this picture. It illustrates the real point. God told Nathan, go. And Nathan tells him, listen, uh, there was a guy, you know, I, I, need, I need your help to judge something, in other words. And I'm going to paraphrase. Uh, I, I, there's, a, there's a man that did something wrong, and I need you to help me judge this person. You know, it was a man who had a lot of sheep, and he had everything, any, everything he wanted. And yet, there was this one guy who only had a little lamb. Mm. Oh, God. Mm. Jesus. Same thing. Same thing. Wow. He only had one little lamb and the guy who had all this stuff, all the cars and all the kings and all the stuff and all the palaces and the riches and the food, everything he wanted went and took that little lamb from that one man. What do you think about it, David? David said, this man should die. Mm. This man should die. And Nathan looked at him. Said, David, yes, Nathan, you're the man. You know, the story of Nathan the prophet hit home immediately. David felt the weight of what he did, and he turned to God for cleansing. That's, see, that's something that David knew. And that's why we have Psalm 51. King David depended upon God's grace and mercy because he knew that God was a gracious God. And listen, he knew that God would forgive him, but something had to happen first. And that's why we have Psalm 51. Read it. If you have never read it, read Psalms 51. You will see that this is the song that he wrote about his repentance. And there's some great revelation in that song. I think that songs today, you know, songs today should have revelation. 
It should, it should cause us to want to look into the Bible. Anyway, the king should have died for committing adultery and murder. He was supposed to stone a person for that. As a matter of fact, the, 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 the law of the Old Testament, the law stated that God told Moses, anyone caught a, an adultery, both of them ought to die. What happened here that he did not die because he was the king? Well, possibly so, but God wanted to show us something about his grace and mercy that is awesome. David experienced in the past God's love and grace in his life, and he thrust himself, I love it, he thrust himself upon upon it, upon the mercy, upon the grace of God. And he begins to pray. And this is his prayer. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your mercy, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. The word blot out is interesting, and I'm not going to go deep into this because I, it's, it's just too deep. But when you look at blot out, you will find that in the story of Noah, when God was washing out the earth from all the filth and all the disobedience, he was blotting out humanity. Mm. And we see the same term. Maybe David's mind went back to that and he saw humanity being waste, uh, uh, becoming uh, the waste of humanity becoming drowned out by God's water, his wrath, his judgment. And he says, blot out my transgression, wash it away, take it away from me. Now, this is the utterance of a broken heart that needed cleansing. Oh, yeah. David knew that only God could blot out his sins. How about you? Do you know that God is the only one that can blot out your sins? We don't need to go to any priest and sit in a booth and say, I have sinned. Mm -hmm. We know much more than some of the saints in the past. We have the written word of God. 66 books. 1189 chapters we have that we can go through and find something that will that will that will describe what or who we are and what we've done. Wash me thoroughly he said from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Notice these two things that he says. He says iniquity and sin. But wait a minute, iniquity is sin. But let's see how deep he goes into it. You see, mercy and grace is needed constantly for repeated sins. He understood this, that it was just not one sin, but he understood, I need to be cleansed by you every time I sin. And look what he says in 51 verse 3. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. We're going to get to sin and iniquity. He understood one thing. And David's heart could not be cloaked from the very presence of righteousness. God revealed his righteousness to David in that story from the, the prophet Nathaniel and his righteousness was seen and David could not cloak his heart anymore. You see, against you, watch this now, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you, notice, you are just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Wow. Wow. It's all about you. I did it, and I did it in front of you. Now, here it is. Now, think, think about this. For the moment, he lost sight of God, but realized that the enormous responsibility of sin fell upon him, mm -hmm. and the confession of his crimes went before the presence of God. As I was studying this this morning, it, I just realized that, yeah, he realized the enormous responsibility and he had to fall before God's presence because the righteousness of God was revealed. And folks, when righteousness is revealed, when you turn the pages of that book and you look and God reveals his righteousness to you, you will fall on your face before the presence of God. Look what he says. Behold, I was born in iniquity and in sin when my mother conceived me. Wow. We can thank Adam for that. Because of his fall, every seed that comes out of me for my children, they are born into iniquity by sin. Now, what is iniquity? Iniquity, and many times I have described it, is the Hebrew word avan. And it means to be pervertedly twisted. It is so deep within our souls that we can't take it out. 
And the thing is this, we're shaping into iniquity. That means this, that as we grow, there are things in our lives that comes to us that begin to twist and make us perverse. Mm -hmm. We see things, we hear things, mm -hmm. we experience things. And you know who are the best teachers? We ourselves. You don't have to tell a child, don't do this. They know. Mm -hmm. Next time you hold that precious, beautiful little child in your hand, remember, there's iniquity and there is sin in your hands. And yet, we find God's mercy in it. Mm -hmm. Oh, they're innocent of any act of sin mm -hmm. until they realize one day they look at you, even as a child, and their hand comes out and they slap you in the face. Why did you do that? What made you slap me in the face? What made you hit me? You don't know anything about that. It is the work of sin and iniquity being twisted inside that little child. And when they grow up, you will find what their sin is. I mean, who ever thought that the mother and father of little Hitler, oh, such a precious little child, so beautiful, turned out to be a more than a mass murderer, nine million people he killed. Mm. Let me ask you a question. If you knew that, would you have done away with him? <laughs> Lord have mercy. And see, this is the point. David sees his depravity. His thoughts of evil his acts of offense, and the influence of his strong temptation. He says, it's living in me. I was shaped into this iniquity. What I am right now. See, he says, I came out of my father a sinner. I went into my mother's womb a sinner. But what I am now and what I did is the proof of iniquity twisting me into this shape. Surely you desire truth in the inner being, he said. Make me know to make me known, make me know wisdom inwardly. He knew that the transformation that he needed was inside of him, and only one thing was able to transform him, and that was the truth. David knew that God delighted in a heart that obeys his law. Hallelujah. This is why it's important that you take some time and read the scriptures. Just to look at what God did in your life and know that the only way we can find transformation inside the heart is by the truth of God. That's why you hear on Talk Straight Bible, the Bible, the Bible, the Bible says, the Bible says, the doctrines of Christ, theology, whatever you want to call it, this is what we want to project. I found that my peace, the peace I have today, Regardless of all the perplexities in our lives, right, Rafina? Regardless of all the, the insecurities, regardless of all the obscurity that we have to deal with in life, we turn to the Word of God and find strength because of His grace, because righteousness is revealed in the Word of righteousness. Amen. The grace and righteousness of God is seen in Christ Jesus. Now think about this. Look what Romans chapter 20, uh, tw uh, 24 says in chapter 3. We read verse 3, right? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But look what verse 24 says. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Oh, how beautiful that is that God's grace reveals our own transgressions. How did I come to understand that I needed a Savior? God's grace came at me through the power of the Holy Spirit, came at you through the power of the Holy Spirit, and showed you, you need a Savior. Without the Savior, you are going to die and go to hell. But grace also reveals our deep need for a Savior, right? Doesn't that, doesn't, isn't it true that when you understood that you fell short of the glory of God, you didn't understand all the theological aspects of it, but you knew the principle of sin was living inside of you and you needed to be saved from what you are to bring you to who he is. Grace leads us to the cross to see our sins and to experience the redemption of Christ. Look what he says in verse 26 of Romans 3. Through God's forbearance, he demonstrates his righteousness at the present time, that he himself is just and also the justifier of the one who puts his trust in Yeshua. Yes, wow. Come on. 
He demonstrates this at the cross. The atonement of God is the very blood of Christ to declare our salvation. And you may say, but I'm saved. Well, let me share something with you about this salvation. We are saved. We are being saved. And we shall be saved. This is what Paul said. The blood of Christ that cleanses us from sin. We shall be saved, he said. And I love that. That no matter what happens in my life, I am secured in Christ. There is no obscurity in my Christ. There is, listen, there is peace from perplexities in my Christ. And I love what Paul says in chapter 5 of Romans, verse 1. Now, now, now. That we have been put right with God through faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He has brought us by faith into the experience of God's grace in which we now live. And so we boast of the hope we have of sharing God's glory. We also boast in our troubles because we know that trouble produces endurance. Endurance brings God's approval and his approval creates hope. This hope does not disappoint us for God has poured his love into our hearts by means of the Holy Spirit who is God's gift to us. Watch this now. For when we were still helpless, enemies in the, in the mind of God, Christ died for the wicked at the time that God chose. It is a difficult thing for someone to die for a righteous person if Watch this. It may even be that someone may dare to die for a good person, but God shows us how much he loves us. Watch this. It was while we were still sinners that Christ died for us by his blood. Listen now. By his blood, we are now put right with God. How much more than shall we be saved by God from his wrath? The beauty of our salvation is that the righteousness that is in Christ, it only is of Christ. The righteousness that is not ours, but it is only Christ because God is the justifier. Why? Because he is just. God is just and he is the justifier. And our declaration of that righteousness is found only in Christ. Now, the question in the very beginning, I said, it's one question that has a double meaning. Why does it keep happening? Why do I fall on our part? Because of sin. But why do I keep experiencing this grace and this power? Because on God's part, it is because of his grace. And when we look to the cross, that's what we see. God bless you. Have a wonderful spirit-filled day. And remember, remember this above all things. Remember this. It'll keep happening, but you need to keep going to him. He will strengthen you. Amen. You are God's chosen treasure. Amen.